Man, I'm bored. I wonder what's going on in true crime YouTube. Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. So today we have an epic mukbang. What? They're gonna be like talking about actual crimes in this video? That seems pretty inappropriate. She thought that she had found the one. She thought that she'd found the person that she was gonna be with for the rest of her life. What? They made adult choices and tried to murder their friend at 12 years old, and that's very disappointing. Why is she dressed up like a bumblebee? That's fine. Oh my god, it's so good. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of this. True crime as a genre has absolutely blown up in the past few years. Just look up true crime on Netflix right now. You'd find a crazy variety of different documentaries and shows about some of the most horrible real life stories you could ever hear of. Some true crime stuff that you might have seen or heard by now might be, you know, the popular show Tiger King, Making a Murderer, The Jinx. You can't really deny the place in pop culture that this kind of stuff is taking right now. And it's also not really all that surprising. We've always been fascinated with stories of crime and mystery. So maybe the fact that it's set in real life makes it all the more interesting. The genre's popularity is obviously not skipped over the internet with millions and millions of users tuning in to listen to their favorite podcaster talk about their favorite, uh, murder? That doesn't seem right. And hey, believe it or not, managed to find its way onto YouTube as well. Hey guys, welcome to True Crime Time ASMR. Now something really cool and interesting about YouTube is that it has all these different little systems and mechanics that are there in place to make its creators as algorithmically compatible as possible. They have this great 1 out of 10 feature that has made me sad many times that's mainly there to make sure that you know for a fact how crap your current video is doing uh, compared to your last ones, which is pretty cool. And having that system in place has resulted in this situation where lots of YouTubers might have this kind of idea in mind, this like thing that they want to release, and over time they tweak it a little bit, make a bit of a change here and there, you know, kind of change their thumbnails all in all, until they end up with this sort of ultimate product that they know for a fact that the algorithm's gonna eat up. Specifically in the true crime community, we've seen that taking place in many different ways, whether it's YouTubers deciding that instead of having a respectful title and thumbnail, going for a more wacky and clickbaity one about other people's tragedies. We also see people doing things like mixing makeup videos with true crime, mixing mukbang videos with true crime, and more. So today, I just want to stop for a second, take this all in, and talk about that. I want to talk about why seeing a title and thumbnail like this, or this, just really feels odd to us, or to me at least. I, I don't know, I, I don't know what you guys are thinking. I'm still making this video. And what is exactly the moral tightrope that true crime creators need to try not fall off from when talking about traumatic events that involve real people in real life? But before going into some of my big boy issues that exist with the genre as a whole, and specifically on YouTube, I do want to address some of the good that true crime may lead to. Now, I don't know if you know this, but especially online, true crime is definitely a female-led field. Most of the big channels I've seen, at least, are run by women, and according to this study I found, it said that over 70% of people who consume true crime podcasts are, in fact, women. Now, it's definitely no secret that lots of women do not feel safe when going outside in public. It's pretty horrible. So lots of people look at these cases that are talked about in true crime videos as, you know, maybe cautionary tales. There's this one Reddit thread that I found where people are discussing in what ways they've learned to better protect themselves thanks to true crime stories they've heard of. And lots of really important things were brought up like not leaving your friends alone on a night out, uh, making sure to lock your doors even when you're inside during the day, even things like making sure to change your daily routine to avoid stalkers, which it's pretty sad that that's a thing that normal, real-life people need to deal with on their day-to-day -day basis. But I guess it's better to know these things than not to. Another big positive that you might see people bring up is that there have been situations in the past where true crime things have managed to reopen cold cases. For example, in the famous case of Robert Durst, where the dumb, idiot, horrible, monster, piece of shit garbage human being, I actually forgot that he was mic'd up for the documentary The Jinx, 
and ended up just fully snitching on himself. He just admitted to everything that he did. When Durst went to the bathroom, his mic was on for what he volunteered. There it is. You're caught. the hell did I do? Kill them all. Of course. I will say, though, that as uh, cool and as badass as that sounds, these situations are pretty rare, and from what I've seen at least, I couldn't find a case where a YouTuber has done anything of that sort. But there's clearly still a great importance for these cases to be out there in the public eye, seen by millions. Lots of true crime videos make sure to put an emphasis on the mishandling of cases by the police, or the complete incompetence of the legal system, stuff like that. Making people aware of the fact that these situations are happening is a decent step towards fixing that. But this being in the public eye and all also invites with it a whole boatload of problems. Real people in real life keep getting re-traumatized. Mindy Pendleton panicked when she learned her stepson's murder would be featured in true crime docuseries on Netflix. Her stomach churned in the days leading up to the debut of the show, which Pendleton worried would glorify the killer his girlfriend at the time, who strangled 25-year-old Robert Mast in 2015. This was my greatest fear, says Pendleton, 64, who helped raise Mast from when he was a toddler. When Netflix asked Mast's family and friends in February 2019 to participate in the series I Am A Killer, those closest to him pleaded with the producers to abandon the project, saying it was inhumane to sell a documentary at the emotional expense of a grieving family. As a parent, a fellow human being, I beg you not to do this," Pendleton wrote in the first of many emails to the producers. But yeah, uh, Netflix did in fact end up releasing the series because, you know, money. And the family ended up finding out that it pretty much ticked off every single thing they were afraid of. In the first few minutes, viewers are introduced to <laughs> the woman who pleaded guilty to murdering Mast. The occasionally tearful <laughs> recounts her years in an abusive relationship before she met and fell hard for Mast in August 2015. 26 days later, he was dead. This article does a great job when it comes to presenting lots of the problems we're going to be talking about in this video. The problems with true crime as a whole, and the problems with the newer Netflixy way of doing true crime, which all those YouTubers have definitely taken inspiration from. As crazy as it may sound, in this video I'm going to be showing to you a different video where a channel has come very close to, I'm not sure if glorifying, but being on the side of the killer. was absolutely heartbroken. I mean, she had invested five years into this relationship. She thought that she had found the one. She thought that she'd found the person that she was going to be with for the rest of her life. You're going to see as well that there are lots of similarities between the problems that this family brings up in the article and the stuff that shows up in the video that we're going to be talking about. The episode casts her, the killer, in a relatively sympathetic light, and at a time when police chiefs, politicians, and the media are often refusing to name mass killers to deny them fame, I Am A Killer takes the opposite tact. In her confession to the police, cast herself as having acted out of a deep love for mass. Absolutely heartbroken. I mean, she had invested five years into this relationship. The public, when they hear this sort of stuff, they, they really eat it up, you know, the killer proclaiming their love to the person whose life they're ended. And the creators of the piece of content know that as well. They know the people of the drama, so they'd really put an emphasis on that kind of angle. Look upon YouTube keywords like love, romance, and true crime together, and you'd see an abundance of these videos. It's pretty obvious that people are looking at these cases as if they were movies, and in a movie, Seeing romance and crime together is pretty fun. Getting the details right. The investigation is quite a non-sensationalized show, talking about the death of Kim Wall. The producer of it, Peter Bose, has said, We checked all the facts. We had a team go through everything. We had lawyers check any legal aspects. Everybody thinks they know the details of the case, but if you get it wrong, you risk upsetting a lot of people. I want to bring up a question. Do you really think that a lot of these YouTubers have like a full-on team of researchers working for them non-stop? Or do they just use Google and Wikipedia? What do you think? The vast majority of true crime videos that I've seen being popular on YouTube are about cases that are fairly recent, you know, stuff that happened maybe less than 10 years ago, which makes it fairly safe to assume that the family of the victims are still around. So you better be damn sure that all the details you have are right. This leads us to one of the most important things that true crime channels usually don't have, 
and that is the consent of the family. You can't possibly claim that you're doing what you're doing out of some kind of deep compassion while at the same time upsetting the people who are closest to the tragedy that you're talking about. The investigation, the show I talked about earlier, worked really close with the family of the victim, Kim Wall. They consulted with them on a lot of different details, and they made it one of their top priorities for the show to be something that celebrates the life and accomplishments of Kim Wall. Having the consent of the family is unbelievably important because you know, some families are just not okay with being in the limelight like that. They don't want to deal with that sort of thing. They don't want people to obsess and have fun with the death of their loved one. They don't want someone to eat popcorn while watching a show about it. It makes sense to have that opinion as well. They don't want people online to harass them, asking them details about the case. Because for them, it isn't just a case. It's an actual traumatic thing that they went through. The family of Shannon Watts is begging for the harassment and rumors they have endured and seen since the brutal murders of Watts and her children to stop. Shannon's father Frank said in a statement, I don't want to draw more attention to the vile material that has been posted online, and so I won't go into specifics. But I will say that our family, including Shannon and her grandchildren, have been ridiculed, demeaned, slandered and mocked in the most vicious ways you can imagine. YouTube really isn't the small little website that it used to be anymore. True crime videos get millions and millions of views. That's an insane reach. That's the size of a small country. To those of you who are watching this video from a small country, how many absolute morons have you met throughout your life? Probably a whole bunch of them. So you best believe that when a video gets millions and millions of views, you'd find a few morons in that group. I don't think that YouTubers have a direct responsibility for every single thing that their audience does, but a family that's dealing with something as bad as this should at least have the right to know that this is the kind of reaction that they may get. I do want to give credit to a YouTuber called Kendall Ray. She often talks about true crime related topics on her channel, and thanks to her platform, she's often gotten the families of the victims to come up to her channel and talk about their personal experience. And yeah, I just think that's a really important thing to do. Dictating the narrative. You may not realize this, but as the audience, it's very easy to make us think or feel a certain way about what's going on on screen. A great example of that is Carol Baskin's portrayal and this scene in Tiger King. Here you have Carol's husband saying that she is quote, reasonably rational, which is immediately followed by an image of the two of them wearing costumes. We then get a soundbite of him saying, my number one goal in life is to make this woman happy, followed by an image in which she has him on a leash. It's the sort of thing that you may see, but you don't actually think about. She's talking and then they cut to all these weird images you obviously end up making the connection they want you to make immediately. Shane Dawson did the same kind of trick a few years ago in his Jake Paul documentary, his stupid, dumb Jake Paul documentary, stupid, stupid thing. Katie Morden would talk about people with antisocial personality disorders while suddenly all this scary music starts playing in the background. And then Shane would say something along the lines of, whoa, isn't this creepy? And then we'd cut to some spooky stock footage that he found online. That was such an obvious case of a person trying to do that, that I feel like people did call him out at the time. But hey, that's definitely not something that always happens. Sensationalization. Netflix's true crime shows have often been criticized for sensationalization. In order to grab the viewer's attention, these Netflix shows often use kind of reality show type editing, using dramatic thuds when a big reveal happens, leaving episodes and cliffhangers and so on. Mm. On YouTube though, it seems like a lot of the inspiration is taken from uh, T slash drama channels. They take a pretty similar casual way of presentation. They use the same kind of slang in their videos. Uh, I mean, it, the similarities are definitely there. Now, there are a few different aspects to sensationalism. On one hand, you can say that this is a pretty tasteless thing to do considering the topics at hand. And on the other hand, you can say that, you know, this is a justifiable tool in the means of fighting for injustice. Wh which I guess is a fair point. But I still can't help but feel weird when I see a title and thumbnail like this. Or this. Or this. Sir. You nasty. I mean, okay. <laughs> This is a pretty huge phenomenon when it comes to the true crime YouTube scene. They will talk about some kind of horrible tragedy crime thing while doing their fucking makeup. I think this presents a few solid layers 
of disrespect and ethical problems as well. First of all, I think this comes pretty damn close to full admission that you're not doing what you're doing out of some kind of deep compassion to the families or uh, the victims or anything of that sort. No, you're mixing one big trend with another because you know it's gonna get you views. You know there's a huge overlap between the mainly female audience that watches true crime videos and the mainly female audience that consumes makeup videos. And you're using that for your financial benefit, full on. It it's hard to pretend that you're not doing that in that situation. Two, you doing your makeup, or for that matter, any kind of secondary action while talking about other people's traumatic events, definitely gives off the vibe that this isn't really something that you care about all that much. If you actually were to care about the subject that you're talking about, you'd imagine that you'd be giving it your full attention and not doing your makeup at the same time. You'd want to be giving it the spotlight that it deserves. Imagine if while talking about this subject, which I do care about, I'd be looking at another screen, doing my taxes, looking sad. What kind of impression would that be giving you? What do you think? To me, this feels like a person who's being interrupted right now. He is just trying to do his taxes in peace while being forced, possibly at gunpoint, to talk about some other stupid thing. Now it may not be the creator's intention, but guess what? That's exactly the feeling I get when I watch one of those makeup true crimers. It just genuinely feels like they don't care about that kind of stuff all that much. A point that someone who watches these videos might bring up is that, hey, they're not even watching these videos. I mean, they're pretty damn long, so lots of people just put them on in the background while doing something else, like a podcast. Their eyes are not 100% glued to the screen at all times, so it doesn't really matter if the person is doing their makeup or playing with Lego dolls while talking about how a person burnt to death. And you know, I guess that's not a point that I'm fully gonna dismiss. It would be a bit better if that sort of disrespect that was already shown by just the act of applying your makeup while talking about the stuff uh, didn't also continue through the words that they actually say in the video. See that the body had been castrated, you know, like um, the lower area. I present to you this video by Bailey Sarian. Actually, you know what, I'll, I'll keep that one for later. I think she deserves her own title card. I present to you instead this video by Daniel Kirsty. Hopeless romantic to cold-blooded killer. This title is already giving me horrendous vibes right here. This sounds like the description of a soap opera episode. But that's not even the worst thing that's gonna happen in front of our eyes today, because today, boxers, Daniel Kirsty comes really, really close to being on the side of the killer. She's like, she's like a few little, tiny little inches away from actually doing it. The video is really, really unhinged. I was just watching the whole thing in pure disbelief. She kicks it off by talking about this woman, the killer, and makes a decision to refer to her by her nickname. I'm gonna avoid saying her actual name because she doesn't deserve it, but she just calls that horrible person by a shortened version of her name, as if she's her friend. She thinks it's important to mention her star sign as well also known as was born on the 6th of September, 1978, making her a Virgo. I know, another Virgo. Kind of feels odd to be doing both of these things, especially calling her by her nickname. I think that's the least this woman deserves after realizing what she did, which is to end not one life, but two. Throughout this video, I'll admit, I was confused, because from the way that Danielle is talking about this person, it definitely doesn't sound like she's referring to a killer. She thinks it's important to mention her struggles fitting in in a new school. Also struggled in school. She struggled to make friends. She struggled to fit in. I do think that this is because she moved to a different country and she just struggled. Aw, oh, poor woman. Wow. I really feel bad for her. Wow, that's so sad. She then talks about how she had a dream of starting a family with like kids or whatever. I, I don't care, sorry. I know it's supposed to be giving us the background to why she did what she did, but it more sounds like you're just being supportive of her, to be honest. And when SD started to talk, I don't know his name by the way, uh, to this man about marriage, about their future, about kids and all stuff like that, he just said he's not ready for a serious relationship. They've been together for five years. <laughs> I don't know about any of you, but that kind of seems like a serious relationship to me. So he wasn't ready for a serious relationship and he was absolutely heartbroken. Oh man, she was heartbroken. Oh no, 
poor monster. A young man, possibly in his early 20s, didn't want to start a family with a soon-to-be killer. Oh, man. Th this is horrible. My, my heart really goes out to this woman. I mean, she had invested five years into this relationship. She thought that she had found the one. She thought that she'd found the person that she was going to be with for the rest of her life. She looks like she's about to cry. Isn't that insane? I'm sorry, this really isn't that tragic of a story. Nothing in this woman's past comes even close to excusing what she did. She ended the life of her first husband for being demeaning and calling her ugly, and the life of her second one for having an affair, which is exactly what she did to her first husband originally. That is her reasoning, and that is also our hero in this video. She thought that she had found the one. She thought that she'd found the person that she was gonna be with for the rest of her life. Now I'll tell you what, I, in no shape or form, think it is okay to be demeaning or call your significant other ugly or anything of the sort. I think that's awful behavior, obviously. But I also don't think that murder is an appropriate response to any degree. This is the same kind of bullshit excuse that you see male abusers throwing out all the time. Oh, she was demeaning. Oh, she belittled me. I'm sorry, but that's just bullshit. You're a horrible, piece of shit monster and you deserve to be put in prison forever. And the same goes to this woman that Daniel Kirsty talks about so fondly in this video. She wanted to find a man, fall in love with him, get married, start a family. This is everything she's ever dreamed of. But unfortunately, things didn't quite work out as she had hoped. This sounds like she's talking about a princess in a fairy tale. Isn't that bizarre? I think that's pretty bizarre. I think that's kind of nuts. I think that's a, an insane thing to do. She brings up so many of these little details all the time that are obviously there to make us feel more supportive of that woman. Talking about how she had a hard time running this ice cream shop alone. He had a lot to say about how she ran the ice cream shop. And it's just kind of like, you know what, Holger, if you don't like it, maybe you should do it yourself. I think this video is really, really disturbing and it's definitely part of something bigger as we'll see in Daniel's comment section in just a second. First of all, let's keep this straight. Us, the public, don't actually know how these events played out. That's why it's pretty bad that Daniel's talking about all this as a fact. There's a very logical reason as to why comes out of this seeming like a hero at the end of the day. It's because she's the only person who survived these relationships. She's the only person who can attest to what happened in any way, shape, or form. It's easy for her to weave this story of heartbreak and a bad childhood because at the end of the day she's just trying to make herself look better. Really how difficult would it be to believe that this woman that we know is capable of doing some really bad stuff has lied. How, how crazy of a thought would that be? And yeah I'd say that in this video Danielle effectively helps this person with her efforts. She essentially is spreading the excuses of a murderer. It's a relationship. She thought that she had found the one. She thought that she'd found the person that she was going to be with for the rest of her life. Notice that Daniel's tone is very, very sympathetic. Lots of messages can come to us, not only from the words that the person is using, but the way they're saying it. If, for example, I read this very story from a news website that makes sure to constantly state at every point that the details about how these events played out are coming from the person who committed the crime and no one else, then this would probably not be as bad, you know? I, I'd realize what's actually happening. But no, her tone is constantly sympathetic towards the killer, and in stark contrast, it is never, ever sympathetic towards its victims. Also, she essentially promotes this killer's stupid book. I'm obviously censoring it, but are you kidding me? Really? You're just putting her book on screen like that? You really think that that's a good idea? And also wrote a book of course titled and all of the sales of that book do go to her son so they are going to something worthy now to show you that the way that i perceived this video is nothing but reasonable you know regarding the empathy and all that uh let's read out some of the comments let's see how daniel's fans perceived this video themselves i'm going to be reading some of the top comments that i found so this isn't really some bottom of the barrel crap over here. This is stuff that people actually gave their likes to. Man, it's so shitty and selfish to waste someone's time for five years like that though. 
Like who dates someone for five years, probably knowing that she wants to eventually get married and have kids. She wanted it so bad, so no doubt she brought it to him before. That's so selfish of him and he should have been more honest with her sooner or broke it off sooner. 563 likes by the way. 563. This comment is pretty great in my opinion because it does such a spectacular job in showing us the exact takeaway that the viewers of this video had when watching it. Thanks to how Daniel presented the way the events went down, the act that has done here is fully ignored in this comment. It's somehow such a non-issue to the writer of it. Maybe they ignored it because it just made them feel more comfortable with being on the side of the murderer in this story, but they decided it would be more worthy to discuss the relationship problems she had before she actually did what she did. These people got all these signals from this person that they're a fan of that this is how they should be reacting to the story, and hey, they reacted perfectly. Yeah, you should be sad that this woman was in a relationship where she wanted kids and the other person didn't. This is the real tragedy in this situation. The next comment I'm about to read out has 44 likes, 44 people read this and were like, yeah, you know what? Y you got a point right there. I'm siding with you on this one. I honestly can't blame her for snapping and losing it. <sighs> she had a rough life, especially when it comes to the men in her life. This is proof people can only take so much before they get to their breaking point. I don't agree with everything she did, but I can understand why she did it. Hey, I, I guess this is just what happens when you broadcast the excuses of a double murderer to the masses. I don't agree with everything she did. Ah, yeah, that's kind of downplaying the situation. Now let's read this next one. Horrible case. Decent start. I hope you're ready for the rest of this comment though. I can't help but feel bad for her. Really? You really think that she's the one that got the shorter end of the stick in that situation? The- the killer? Really? And it does my heart good to know that even in prison, she found a way to support the child she so desperately wanted. Yeah, that's a reference to that stupid book that she wrote, that Danielle decided to, to show in her video. Yeah, great- great stuff. Great stuff all around over here. I actually felt heartbroken for- Starting with her dad, she was surrounded by trashy men living off of her. One way or another, she's a criminal. If this was a movie, the killings would have been satisfying. My jaw actually dropped like in a cartoon the first time I read this comment. This is like actually insane, right? This, this is an insane comment to post. Guess what? This isn't a movie, you absolute maniac. That's one of the things I realized here. I think lots of these people are treating these cases as if they were playing out in front of them in a movie. You're seeing this on a screen, you're detached from the get-go, and this makes it easy to make us, the viewers, think a certain way. And in this situation, we're seeing things exactly like the perpetrator of the crime wanted us to see it. Which is pretty cool, I guess. Or if you don't know what mukbangs are, it's essentially just this um, type of video where you talk about whatever, while eating whatever. Um, seems pretty fun, to be honest. Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. So today we have an epic mukbang. We actually went to our favorite Thai food. I don't know if you recognize the song that they're playing, but that's the Sneaky Snitch. That's the song that they used to put in like, Gmod Funny Moments videos. They're playing that while talking about a woman's death the best Thai food you will ever have. It's a small little hole in the wall place in Hollywood. It's amazing. It's amazing. You won't find any pod CEO like this. You won't find any chicken like this. It's impeccable. If you told me that this video is a parody to show us how desensitized we've become to other people's tragedies, I'd honestly believe you. That would seem really, really believable in my eyes. A few minutes into the video, the music transitions in an almost comedic way into this like horror copyright free music. But in 2013, there was an elevator footage that got released in public by the police department of Los Angeles. I doubt there's many of you who do not know about this case already. There in the year 2015, <sighs> Pinely Pineson was shot in the head three times and was left for, oh, can you pass me the teriyaki sauce please? Thanks. He was left for dead on the side of the street 
while no one was willing to help him. It was so sad. Obviously, this presents a lot of similar problems as we've seen in the makeup true crimers, but somehow these problems are amplified by a billion. Because while you might be able to claim that putting on makeup is a fairly casual act, there's nothing casual about consuming a whole cheesy tower of onion rings. In terms of making the tragic story that you're talking about feel secondary or even cheap to the viewer, I mean, come on, you're seeing this right now. Does this look like a like a good setting to talk about trauma? I don't I don't really think so, to be honest. Most of these videos kick off with a few solid minutes of talking about some other topic that has nothing to do with the case that you're supposed to be discussing. If you guys love KFC Jolly Bee fried chicken, this is the best fried chicken you will ever have and this will blow all your favorite fried chickens out of the water. The way they move from talking about chicken wings to talking about a person's death is like borderline satirical. This is so weird. I want us now to take a look at Stephanie Sue's channel. She's really a top dog when it comes to these type of videos with over 2 million subs. This is her latest video at the time of me recording this. Check out this crazy, crazy juxtaposition in the title. On one side, we have this gruesome question. Why were his foot and head detached? The sketchy body in the barn case. Horrifying and gruesome, right? A, a bit too gruesome. Some might even say or suggest that you're using that for clicks. But then immediately afterwards, boom, giant McRib mukbang. Jesus Christ. Seeing these two things placed right next to each other at the same time feels really, really odd. We got on one side horrifying death, then suddenly McRibs. Family losing their loved one, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pinely Pineson decapitated, Alfredo Fettuccini, the girl in the suitcase, <sighs> cheesy onion ring tower. Let's try this. Oh my god, so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, back to the McCrib video though. After nearly 10 minutes of talking about absolute nonsense, they then kick the topic off by laughing at how they can't pronounce the victim's name. M-A-T-E-U-S-Z. How would you pronounce that? Matuz, Matuez? He said Matuez. <laughs> he said Matuez. How do you pronounce it? Matuz. I literally have been playing that voice message non-stop and I still don't know how to pronounce it, so we're gonna call him Matt. I know, this is like the most American thing that I've ever done. Like they decide to call him Matt instead. If you're gonna be mentioning this man's name throughout the entire video, at least try to say it. Don't fucking change it to Matt. He but said Matt too as a How do you pronounce it? The bizarre juxtaposition comes into effect in the video itself as well. They start talking about the case and then a second afterwards, they get distracted and this dude would start talking about a guy he knows who can eat a Big Mac in two bites. I seen someone eat like Big Mac in like, uh -huh. no joke, two bites. Mm. I was like mm. so shocked. You're impressed? The whole thing just actually seems like a joke to them. That They're treating it as if they're talking about like gossip that they heard the other day. Stephanie keeps throwing in these little remarks all the time. Now, his fiance at this point is uh, super pregnant. Like, she's ready to pop. Mm. Like, she has one bite of a jalapeno filled, you know, something. She's gonna give birth. Yeah, that's a great joke about this man's child that will never get to see his father. That's really, really funny. I'm, I'm laughing my ass off right now. This is hilarious. I guess I'll say that all in all, this is the extent of Stephanie Sue's crimes in this video. I mean, at least she doesn't side with the killer. Now that I say that, that's that's an unbelievably low bar. But I think the worst example of having a tone that's definitely off in your video comes in the form of Bailey Sarian. She's a makeup artist turned true crime phenomenon. Each week, Bailey showcases the latest in makeup while dishing the juiciest details of notorious crime cases, which is so hilarious and I would have never put those together. The body had been castrated, you know, like, um, the lower area gone goodbye yeah that's really funny that's that's hilarious that's that's really funny i'll tell you what if these videos were talking about some fake people and fake events that didn't happen in real life then i'd be like yeah sure this is some kind of dark comedy bit if this was on snl as a sketch i might say oh SNL is funny again, everybody. Let's watch SNL. Uh, but that's clearly not the case. What's up, Bailey? Hi, Kelly. Hi. I mean, how did you 
some up with it. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, I've always been fascinated with true crime and makeup. Now, I'll tell you what, I have no idea if Bailey's actually the first one to combine true crime and makeup, but she is definitely the one to popularize it. Her videos just get millions and millions of views. She has around 6 million subscribers at the time of me recording this. And the people love her, and I get why. I mean, if you watch her videos, she's funny, she has a captivating personality, she's good at makeup. I, I think, clearly, I, I'm not a source of information when it comes to this subject. This isn't me attacking her ability to entertain or attacking her character. I just think that her videos are the epitome of cheapening and sensationalizing true crime. The Sugar Baby Cannibal, Thanksgiving Feast or Self-Defense? What is this thumbnail? What is this... What is this face that she's doing? Why is she doing that face? Sex, drugs, and cannibalism. Great. Yeah. Oh, mm. Mm. Cannibalism. Mm. The Rosewood Massacre, Dark History. Yeah, the Rosewood Massacre, a horrendous historic event. The thumbnail? Her posing to the camera. Smiling. I will say though, specifically about the Dark History series, most of the events that she talks about in that series happened hundreds of years ago. And in this specific one, the point of it is to teach people of a really dark moment in American history that isn't really talked about in school all that much. Which, I guess is a decent cause. But that doesn't really change the fact that this thumbnail is really out of whack. Trying to look cute for the camera as you're discussing something this dark comes off as really, really distasteful. And so do some of the things that she says on camera as well. So Natalie and a group of her friends are headed to Aruba for this kind of unofficial graduation trip. And it's with 124 fellow students, fellow graduates. So that's cool. I mean, I got to go to the Cheesecake Factory when I graduated. So good for them, Aruba. Wow. This is a case about a young girl's disappearance in Aruba who is now presumed dead. Good for them, Aruba. Wow. Yeah, no, good for them. Good for them, yeah. No, oh, good for them. Bailey only got to go to the Cheesecake Factory. Good for them. Here is a thumbnail of Bailey dressed up as a bumblebee while talking about the stabbing of a young girl. Please do let me know. What do you think about that? Do you think this is appropriate in any sort of way, shape, or form? Normally, you know, I have a little comment like, they should be in prison longer. But it's like, I don't know. What they did was awful. I'm not trying to make an excuse or erase any of that. What they did is freaking awful. And they made adult choices. They made adult choices and tried to murder their friend at 12 years old, and that's very disappointing. Very disappointing. That's kind of the understatement of the year. Very disappointing is what I'd say if I found out that my kid has decided not to do their homework. Not if they stabbed someone. I decided to put this up for discussion on my Instagram, which is at Pinely Box, by the way. You should, you should feel free to follow that. Don't be shy. And I asked the people, the masses, Knowing the context of this video, what do you think about this thumbnail? What are your feelings that you get when you see it? A very large portion of the replies were mentioning words like disrespect. The word disrespect was mentioned quite a bit. Well, a lot of people asked, why is she a bee? Uh, the answer, I think, this I think this was an, a Halloween video. I think that's why she was dressed up as a bee. Still seems odd, though. <laughs> Some people said that it's gross clickbait. Some people said that the presentation gives off the vibe that she's about to talk about YouTube drama, which yeah, th these are all sentiments that I definitely agree with. But something I really wanted to see is what do the people who watch Bailey will say to her defense uh, when it comes to this situation? Cause it's pretty obvious from the way that I put things in my story, what is my personal stance on the situation? I mean, all of her videos are literally the same. Uh, there's a character limit, so I'm guessing they might be talking about the presentation of the videos, that the thumbnails follow a certain format. I don't think it's a problem, she's pretty respectful. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Oh, hey, how about we go back to that sugar baby cannibalism video that I talked about earlier? When they got inside the house, they found Bill. Oh, oh, they found him, all right. Okay, they found him. Bill's bedroom was demolished. I mean, like, it looked like a war zone, according to them. I mean, again, they're newlyweds. Maybe they're getting a little freaky, but this was not that. They take it down and stuff, and they see that the body had been castrated. You know, like, um... The lower area, gone, goodbye, removed, sayonara, see you later, disappeared, vanished, all of the above. The way she decided to tag the section where she describes all this gruesome, gruesome stuff is with the words, what happened? 
Jesus Christ. Which is so hilarious and I would have never put those together. But hey, I guess at the end of the day for Bailey and channels like her, these additions like throwing in jokes or sassy remarks or doing your makeup or doing a mukbang at the same time while talking about this stuff is the main thing that differentiates between them and reading a Wikipedia article. And they're gonna keep on doing these things because this is clearly what their audience wants to see. This stuff gets so many views. Do I think these people should remove their videos because of the harm that they can do? I don't know, I'm, I'm not their boss, I'm not in charge of them, and I'm not really here to try and cancel anyone either. I just wanted to make this video because I think that we should always remember that as much as we may enjoy these videos, there will always be an inherent problem with trying to turn these horrible events that actual human beings went through into a cute little product. Because at the center of it all, we have real people who keep getting re-traumatized every single day. And man, do I really pray to God that none of them end up stumbling upon any of these videos. Okay, I think I managed to get everything I wanted off my chest. If you guys liked this video, make sure to let me know because I'm definitely considering going down this sort of longer form of content on my channel. So yeah, I mean, vote with your views, vote with your subscriptions. If you want to have a little chat with me or hey, even an argument, I'm fairly responsive on my Twitter at Pinely with two Y's and on Instagram at Pinely Box. And yeah, you know, share this video with your grandma who constantly watches makeup true crime videos. Show this to the world, put it on subreddits, I don't know. And if you reach the end of this video, make sure to include the word uh, Bumblebee into the comment to confuse everyone else. And other than that, Goodbye.